Everyone keeps repeating the same exact advice about applying to medical school. Apply to 15 to 20 schools, follow this strategy, use this list. But here's the thing, 60% of applicants don't get in. And if that's the outcome, then why are we all following the same playbook? It's time to stop parroting advice and start thinking from first principles. And by incorporating this one change that's very often overlooked, you're gonna improve your odds of getting a medical school acceptance by 30%. And it's stupidly simple. In fact, shocking that more people don't actually talk about this. But first, before we dive into that strategy, it's important to first understand how we got here. So I was actually having a conversation with a new hire, a new employee for our team at Med School Insiders, and I was explaining the history of the company, why we do what we do and how we do what we do, why it's a completely different and unique approach from anything else out there. So back in 2016, I was wrapping up med school, I was gonna start residency in 2017, and there are only a few YouTube channels about medical school, about studying. And I didn't necessarily agree with a lot of the advice. I think for many of us, we study very suboptimally in high school and oftentimes in college. Once you get to med school, as they say, you're drinking from the proverbial fire hydrant. So you have to consume a lot of information in a short period of time. And you are forced to change your study strategies, especially if you wanna be a top performer and match into competitive specialties. So watching the videos, I thought, dude, I don't necessarily agree with this. In fact, I think this is actually harming some of these pre-meds. And it hit me hard because I was one of those pre-meds that did not have any mentors or family or family friends that were doctors. And I was figuring this out as I went. And I was making mistakes, learning from those mistakes, and I wanted to pay it forward. And it was a very challenging pre-med journey for me. And Admittedly, I was also battling a newly diagnosed autoimmune condition, Crohn's colitis, it's like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So yeah, not, not an easy time. And I had to figure everything out from scratch. So once I did, I wanted to share what actually worked. So if you guys go back to the first ever Med School Insiders video, it was shot on an iPhone, just like right above my head on a $16 Amazon Basics tripod with just a little pen on a piece of paper. There's no lighting, no editing but it now has 700,000 views because the advice resonated. So very low production quality, but gold in the actual content. And I actually, a few years later, remade that exact same video with the same exact script, the same exact content. And now that video, which is now animated, higher production quality, has close to 4 million views. That video was so money that a lot of people actually commented on that video saying, hey, I copied Ali Abdal, but I was like, Guys, I'm just remaking my own video from two years ago. So that's not possible. But this showed me the power of doing things differently, doing things right, so much so that other people would even try to imitate you. It's like, it's flattering, right? Now this happens all the time when it comes to getting into med school and becoming a doctor. So let's cover some common examples. One that I wanna focus on is apply to 15 to 20 medical schools. And you may ask, where does that number come from? Here's the truth is just the average, the average number of schools that medical school applicants apply to. But the average applicant doesn't get in. Again, 60% of applicants do not get any acceptances. So then why are we copying the strategies that clearly don't work for most people? And this points to a much deeper issue in the pre-med and med school culture, which is that people repeat advice that sounds good but they don't actually think it through and talk to the nuance, the gray area, the details that actually move the needle. And it's this kind of parroting that I believe can seriously hurt your career because, well, let me just give you a few examples. So example one is MD versus DO. And many people will say that it's basically the same. That's the popular thing to say right now. We've made many videos explaining why they're definitely not the same. And if you're a pre-med, it can significantly influence your career trajectory and your options in the future. So do not take that decision lightly. Example number two, it doesn't matter where you go to medical school. So let's now condense it just to MD. Let's not even talk about DO. So just MD, if you go to Harvard versus whatever other school, MD, doesn't matter. That's again, an oversimplification. So the reason being, yes, if you get through med school successfully, you do the work, you're gonna have an MD at the end of your name. You're gonna be a doctor. But there are so many other intangibles or things that you may not consider that will influence your future career. Just for starters, this is not a complete list. You have certain specialties you may not even have exposure to at smaller programs. You may have fewer research opportunities. It can be a lot more challenging to match into certain specialties from some med schools versus others. And also your opportunity for scholarships and the overall cost. And then a similar flavor of this is that if you're going to primary care, it doesn't matter, just go to any MD school. And then the rebuttal to this is, Hey, if you're not trying to go into neurosurgery or plastic surgery, go to any school. If you want to do primary care, who cares? But here's the issue. 
This advice ignores the fact that three quarters of med students change their mind about what specialty they wanna match into from MS1 to graduation. Three quarters. So you don't want to limit the number of options you have before you really know what it is that you wanna do. And I've been there. I was dead set on pediatric gastroenterology because of my own gut condition, but long story short, after getting exposure to the field, more exposure than I had as a uh, pre-med, and pre-med I like, you know, shadowed GI doctors, but then actually working more in med school and getting greater exposure, I realized not for me. Okay, the final example is psychiatry is the new neurosurgery, right? So it's, it's competitiveness. This was just a few years ago where psychiatry was getting more competitive and people said, oh my God, it's now one of the most competitive specialties, watch out. Look, when you actually look at the data, it went from number 19 out of 21 or 22 to number 15. And then the year after that, it went back to number 18. So yes, it did get slightly more competitive for those two years, but I mean, 15th place is still like towards the very bottom, the bottom quartile of the list, right? What you have to remember is that when it comes to discussions about specialty competitiveness, it's oftentimes based on just like anecdotes and vibes rather than actual hard data. And everyone is incentivized to say that their specialty is more competitive than it is because it makes it seem more prestigious, more competitive, more impressive that they became that specialist, right? So you might be noticing a theme here. I very much care about giving pre-meds and med students the truth because I think that was hard for me to find when I was in training. And um, whether it's that study strategy stuff or the data, several years ago, before the pandemic, we created the specialty competitiveness index that takes all the official data, puts it on a massive spreadsheet, and then you can actually download that spreadsheet and play with the data. But more recently, I realized it's kind of clunky to use a spreadsheet in this manner. So I created this new tool. You can use it totally free, no login, no email or anything. It's at specialtyrank.com. And it's the same exact data, but rather than doing it in a spreadsheet, you actually have all the years you can select at the top. There's just different tabs. And then you can actually customize the ranking algorithm based on what you think matters most. So when you first load the program, it has our default weighting. So, you know, step two score and match rate are the two most important factors. And then there's research and yada, yada. But if you say, hey, you know what? I disagree. I think that match rate should be less important or more important. You can actually use the sliders and adjust the weightings exactly the way that you want. And then the specialties below will update their order based on the preferences that you have. Again, totally free, no login or anything. Just go to specialtyrank.com and I hope you find it useful. And before we dive back in, let me know in the comments between those three ideas of MD versus DO, um, which specialties are or are not competitive, like psych to being the new neurosurgery. And then also, med school ranking and prestige, how much it matters. Let me know if you want me to dive deeper into any of those videos with a comment down below, just for me to gauge interest. Okay, so let's take that first principles approach and apply it to your med school application. So you wanna look at the data, you wanna look at probabilities, you wanna look at human psychology and not just repeat what you've been told by other people, but actually question each of those decisions. So as an example, applying to 15 to 20 schools, why only 15 to 20? If that's the average, giving you average results. If you apply to more or fewer, does that give you different results? So what we actually recommend to our clients that we work with one-on-one -on -one at Med School Insiders is apply to at least 25, but ideally 30 or more schools. And the reason is very simple. Just think of it in extremes, right? If you apply to just one medical school, you're putting all your eggs in that one basket. Now let's say that med school has a 3% acceptance rate. You have 3% odds of getting into that medical school if you apply to just one school. But if you apply to two, and now you have 3% odds at two different schools, your odds are greater. You add five, 10, and, and so on. Let's say you apply to 100 schools. At 100 schools, you're not necessarily guaranteed to get a med school seat because if 99 schools already rejected you, then the chance that the 100th is gonna accept you is pretty low, right? So there are diminishing returns. But thinking from these mathematical foundations, there's going to be this logarithmic curve with diminishing returns. So again, don't apply to 100 schools. But when you apply to just one, your odds of getting in are very, very low. You apply to more and you get a massive increase in your odds of getting one or more acceptances. And then as you apply to more and more, it starts flattening out. But it doesn't really flatten out at 15 to 20. It starts flattening out at a much higher number. That's why we recommend 30 plus schools. Now, 30 sounds like a lot, and I'm sure that you have some valid counterpoints, but before we get there, I wanna first explain asymmetric risk. So there's this very powerful idea in venture capital and in finance, and it's called asymmetric risk. And think of it this way. Venture capitalists make a ton of these bets, these sizable bets, let's say a million dollars, $2 million on many different companies, many different startups. Most of them are gonna fail. Let's say in a given year, one VC invests in 30 companies. And let's say that 29 of them fail. So 29 times $1 million, that's $29 million down the drain. But that 30th investment, that one 100 X's. So they go from one mil 
to $100 million. They made so much on that one winner that it covered the cost of those first 29 and then some. They're walking home with $70 million. All right, so rich VC investors aside, how do you actually apply this to medical school? Where can you have low downside, but massive upside to certain decisions? Applying to more schools follows that same logic. So let's say you apply to the average number of schools, which is 18, but then you choose to follow Med School Insider's advice. Now you apply to 30 schools. That's gonna add two issues, right? Number one, it's gonna cost more money because every additional medical school you apply to, they charge you for. And number two, now you have all these additional secondaries to apply to, but let's break down each one. So with AMCAS, the primary application service when you apply to med school, the first school is more expensive. I think it's like 175, but then each one after that is $45. So if you apply to 18 schools, you're paying around $940. But if you apply to 30, it's $1,480. That's a difference of $540. But then there are secondaries or secondary applications, which you receive from each individual school after you submit your primary. So each secondary, like the, the cost is gonna vary by school, but let's say on average it's about $100. So with 12 extra schools, that adds an additional $1,200 to your application cost. So in total, that difference is $1,740. And that might seem steep until you realize what is at stake. If you don't get into medical school this application cycle, that's a $364,000 delay in income because that's the average salary of a current doctor. So each year you apply to med school and you fail to get in, that is a $364,000 mistake. Because if you got in, then you would be making that salary one year earlier. Now there's nothing wrong with taking a gap year intentionally, right? That means you don't apply to med school, but you're doing other things in those gap years, nothing wrong with that. But if you take an unintentional gap year, meaning you applied to med school and failed to get in, that's what I call an unintentional gap year, that is a $364,000 mistake. And just to round that out, the other counterpoint is that, hey, Kevin, I'm not gonna have the time to write all these different essays. Like 30 essays, that's, that's too much. Here's the thing. A lot of secondaries repeat the same themes about like adversity, why would you pick this school, etc. So the more secondaries you do, the easier each one gets. So by the time you get to secondary number 15, 20, and so on, it's a lot of recycling. It gets easier and easier with each one. All right, quick story time from my own application cycle. I applied to 40 schools, which in hindsight was overkill because I had a 525 MCAT and a 3.97 GPA. And I got bombarded. I had like more than two dozen interview invites and of course 30 something secondaries. But here's the cool thing. At that point, I was able to pick and choose. So I didn't even do all of my secondary applications. I didn't even attend all of my med school interviews. After I got into my number one choice, which was UC San Diego, I canceled NYU, I canceled Cornell, I canceled University of Hawaii, I canceled all these other schools because now I was in the position of optionality. And I wanna create that same optionality for you. Now, when you look at the official AAMC data on med school admissions, you're gonna see that the average matriculation rate is around 40 to 44% per year meaning there's close to a 60% chance that you have to reapply. Now, if you take that 60%, 0.6, and you multiply it by that lost year of income, which is $364,000, you get about $218,000. Now, at Med School Insiders, we have a massive roster of more than 250 doctors who have not only gone through med school successfully themselves and matched into neurosurgery and plastics and derm and every specialty, but also served on admissions committees. So students work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And when they work with them on a comprehensive package, their acceptance rate is not 40 or 44 or 50, it's 97%. But that 97% includes all the students we worked with, even those who didn't actually follow the advice, they delayed their secondaries, they didn't follow the strategy. When you actually exclude those students and look at just those who did follow the recommendations, submitting things on time, having a strategic school list, et cetera, their acceptance rate was 99%. But remember, you don't only want to increase your odds of any acceptance you wanna increase your odds of getting into your top dream schools and having your pick, right? Having multiple acceptances like I did and then saying, hey, where should I go? Hey, by the way, what are your scholarship options? And then having each school pit against each other to actually increase my scholarship opportunities. So to save me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these are the same tactics we use with our students to give them crazy rates of scholarship. And look, I know some people get discouraged based on their background or their history and things like that. I get that, I know where you're coming from, but it's still possible. Like I'm South Asian, South Asians and East Asians, mathematically, statistically need to have the highest stats to even get into med school, let alone get scholarship, right? And working to get better stats is a big part of that equation, but a big part and actually a very underappreciated part 
is also the way that you craft your story and your narrative and position yourself as an applicant that can add diversity and value to the upcoming medical school class, which most people don't think about. And that's why they leave a lot of opportunity on the table. So in summary, I want you to challenge assumptions. Think in first principles. If everyone says apply to 15 to 20 schools, ask them why. How do they arrive at that number? The fact is most people arrive at certain conclusions or suggestions based on just parroting other people without actually thinking it through themselves. And I want you to be very careful because if you go on SDN or Reddit, it's a lot of pre-meds who are reading from other pre-meds, watching some videos, and then thinking that they have expertise, and then despite good intentions, misleading other people. And that's actually one of the most dangerous things in life in about any domain is not knowing what you don't know. So in terms of everything there is to know on a given topic with a pie chart, there's a tiny sliver of what you know you know. There's another tiny sliver, maybe a little bit larger, about what you know you don't know but then 95% of that pie chart is what you don't know you don't know. And I can relate to this. I, I've been obsessed with cars ever since I was young. And I used to think when I was younger that what makes a driver fast, a Formula One driver or a rally driver, I used to think it was about nailing the line and then anytime the car oversteer, you just gotta catch it and make sure you don't spin out and crash. Oh, how ignorant I was because I didn't know things that I know now. Like I had no idea slip angle the physics of how the tire actually deforms, trail braking with weight transfer and how you can actually get, you can save so many, so much time, so many tenths or even seconds in a, in a single lap by getting the car to rotate with the brake pedal as you approach. There's a great quote from Andretti himself that was something like, so many racing drivers don't understand that you don't just steer a car with the steering wheel, but with the brake and the throttle. And I was one of those people that just didn't understand that until only a handful of years ago. And that same principle applies when it comes to applying to med school. So to help you pursue the truth and understand what is actually backed by data and what is just anecdote, I'm gonna share two free tools with you. I already mentioned one, which is the specialty competitiveness ranking tool, which you can find at specialtyrank.com. And the second one is actually a specialty chance predictor. So if you have an idea of what specialty you wanna match into, you can go on this tool, also totally free, put in your status of being a pre-med or a med student. If you're a med student, it'll ask for your step two score. And if you're a pre-med, it'll ask for your MCAT and then convert the MCAT to the equivalent step two score based on the percentiles of not all MCAT test takers, but of medical school matriculants. That's a very important distinction there. And then it'll actually tell you your odds of matching into that given specialty based on the official NRMP data, which you can also find at the other specialty rank tool. So we use that official NRMP data in both tools, but one tool just lets you see all the data and the other tool lets you see your chance of getting into that specialty with your current stats. And you can find that last tool at residencypredictor.com. Links to both tools are down in the description. Much love my friends, and I'll see you all in that next one.